I'm Laura Bancroft. I'm from Florida Hospital. I'm going to be talking about hemoglobinopathies. So what are hemoglobinopathies? So these are a broad range of genetic defects, but they all result in an abnormal structure of the globin chain of hemoglobin. So the two primary diseases we're going to discuss will be sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So starting off, we want to look at the hemoglobin molecule. So what is this? So this is an iron-containing oxygen transport system comprised of both metals and proteins located within the red blood cells. So almost all vertebrae, and surprisingly some invertebrates, contain hemoglobin. So this is comprised of four globular protein subunits called the globin. So there's an alpha chain and a beta chain. In addition to that, there are iron-containing heme groups, and these are what actually bind the oxygen. So hemoglobin variants exist, both part of normal development as well as abnormal pathology. So embryos, fetal development, they have different proteins within the hemoglobin molecules compared to the normal adult. In addition to that, there are postnatal variants hemoglobin A, A2, and F that occur, and there are also variants where there actually is no clinical pathology. So when it comes to sickle cell disease, what we're looking at is that the normal hemoglobin chain has glutamate on the sixth position of the beta chain. When it comes to abnormal pathology, you have the different variants of hemoglobin, S, C, SC disease, as well as many others that you appreciate here, where there's actual replacement of that position with valine, with hemoglobin S, and lysine for hemoglobin C. In addition, there are heterozygous variants where you can actually combine the abnormal hemoglobin with things such as thalassemia, where we get sickle thal. So coming to sickle cell disease, this is an autosomal recessive disease such that if both alleles are involved with homozygous disease, you actually have sickle cell anemia. If just one allele is involved, it's a heterozygous presentation, and this is when you have sickle cell trait or the carriers of disease. So when you have abnormal uh, configuration of the hemoglobin, when you are exposed to extremes of temperature, to stress, to dehydration, you can actually have the sickling configuration of the red blood cell. So this occurs primarily around the sub-Sahara African region, the Mediterranean, in areas where there is a high prevalence of malaria. So patients who have evolved and survived the multiple years and years of malaria um, are actually having a beneficial effect with their sickle cell disease. And the reason for this is that the parasites actually live within the red blood cells. So with this shortened lifespan of the abnormal sickle cell shaped, they actually only last about 10 to 20 days. And with that, they're actually eliminating the parasites from the red blood cells in these sickle cell carriers. Unfortunately, though, there still is the chronic anemia that occurs with sickle cell, and we'll go through what we expect to see with imaging. So normally, the red blood cells flow with their biconcave shape through the sinusoids, through the capillaries, but with sickle cell, they actually become clogged within the sinusoids, and with that, there's going to be stasis, microvascular occlusion, and eventually infarction of the soft tissues as well as the bone. With this, we can actually have superinfection with osteomyelitis involving the bone, with primarily salmonella being the primary pathogen in these patients. So with the anemia that occurs, the body has to then recruit red blood cells, so there's going to be an effect marrow expansion, as well as hyperplasia within the bones, as well as with an extramedullary hematopoiesis. So what this is, is thrombosis and infarction of the red marrow. So in children, there's a prevalence of red marrow throughout the body. And when the sickle cells occur, they can clog up and create infarcts, specifically in the hands. So typically, it's in young children between six months and two years. So this can be exacerbated by cold temperatures. So this can really bring out the sickling in the cells, the abnormal configuration, and acutely, you're going to have soft tissue swelling. With time, you're going to see periosteal reaction, as you can see in this radiograph on the right, as well as osteolysis. With the reparative response in the chronic phase of the disease, you're going to see sclerosis.
And then on top of that, patients then once again are at increased risk for infection, specifically with salmonella. So looking at bone infarcts, what do they look like on imaging? So with time, they're going to become patchy and sclerotic, but in the developing phase, it can have like a very ill-defined snowstorm appearance. With time, if it starts to become more confluent, it can actually look to be bone within bone or diffusely sclerotic. It's more common in the weight-bearing joints, um, specifically the femoral heads of the hips. If you look at what shows on the MR, we have a T1 image on the top, T2 weighted image on the bottom. This is the serpentine line between the alive and the dead bone because of these bone infarcts. And they're typically very well demarcated, serpentine, and the result is because of the death. Here's a less common location of uh, bone infarct within the second metacarpal head, but it has the similar features of the serpentine, classically subarticular involvement where there is a line between alive and dead bone. Patients with sickle cell can also have growth disturbances, and this is oftentimes due to the premature physeal fusion. So if this is a diffuse fusion across the physis, there's going to be overall bone shortening. If it's more asymmetric, you can actually have a slanting of the articular surfaces, and actually this is most common in the ankle region. When it involves the vertebral bodies, it can result in decreased height, so the patients are short, and they can also have kyphoscoliosis. Here's a classic chest x-ray with multiple presentations of the musculoskeletal region. So if you look at the left humeral head, you see that classic line of sclerosis because of the bone infarct. If you look at the vertebral bodies, you have the end plate compression deformities, and you also have cholecystectomy because of the um, uh, mineralized gallstones that have occurred because of the chronic destruction of the red blood cells. So zoning into the thoracic spine, you can see the classic H-shaped or Lincoln log-shaped vertebrae because of the end plate compression fractures. Once again, infection is common, and actually infection of the bone is actually more common than septic arthritis. Growth disturbances, we've also mentioned. So looking at a CT of the sickle cell patient, this is the classic end plate compression fractures that occur right in the central portion of the vertebral end plates. And there's overall sclerosis with coarsening of the trabeculae because of the abnormal marrow that has packed the cells. So with that packing of the cells, you can actually have deossification where there's marrow hyperplasia. You can have widening of the skull, or in this case, this is the fish vertebrae that you're appreciating. So this is the smooth indentation, the compression fractures that occur. And if you look at the radiograph of the salmon, this is what we're referring to as fish vertebrae with that biconcave shape. Fish mouth and codfish are also synonyms that have been used. So here's a patient who has sickle cell osteomyelitis. So if you look at the T1 and the T1 enhanced images on the right, you can appreciate the fact that there's abnormal replacement, abnormal marrow enhancement in this patient with overall infection because of salmonella. Here's a different patient where you can appreciate this large glenohumeral joint effusion, and this also proved to be septic arthritis with salmonella infection. Soft tissues can also become infected. They can also have areas of infarction. In this case, this was a seated salmonella abscess within the gluteal muscles of this child. Patients can also have leg ulcerations because of the soft tissue thrombosis, the vaso-occlusion, and just the overall poor blood supply. And specifically over areas of bony prominences, you're going to have leg ulcerations that are more common. Also note the areas of bone infarction as well as red marrow hyperplasia throughout the remaining portion of this ankle. So with the red marrow expansion, this is going to chronically widen the medullary spaces as it's packed in more and more cells. With that, it's going to have mass effect and thinning of the trabeculae, and eventually that's going to then coarsen it with the ones that are remaining. So the osteopenia is going to occur, and with that comes the risk of increased insufficiency fracture. So the calvarium can have a very classic hair-on-end appearance, although this is actually more common in thalassemia, which we're going to discuss next. 
Marrow on T1 weighted imaging is going to be diffusely low in signal as it replaces more and more red marrow in the normal yellow marrow prevalence in the adult. So here's a case of a patient who has the classic hair on an appearance. If you look at the skull on both the CT scan as well as the MRI images, it goes in a spoke wheel fashion all throughout the thickened calvarium. Also note the area of encephalomalacia in this patient with a prior stroke with sickle cell disease. Here's a classic look of a sickle cell spine. If you look at the T1-weighted imaging in this adult, there's diffusely abnormal signal throughout the marrow. It's actually um, iso-intense to the intervertebral discs, and this is an abnormal presentation, whereas patients should normally have much more yellow marrow in the adult phase. Here's an ankle where you can see a lot of red marrow reconversion as this has occurred throughout the tibia as well as the calcaneus. So when it comes to sickle cell, you're going to have the low marrow signal for what we've already discussed, the red marrow reconversion. But in this case, you can see it's much more lower in signal intensity. This is oftentimes because of the concomitant effect of the iron deposition from the chronic anemia, as well as the transfusions that are used to treat these patients with sickle cell. So once again, compare this to what a normal, predominantly fatty marrow should look like in the adult patient. So it's important to understand the normal development of marrow patterns in order to see how this reverts when there is red marrow hyperplasia. So in the infant, there's normally red marrow throughout all of the skeleton and infusely throughout the long bones, as you see here in this femoral demonstration. As you progress on to childhood, more yellow marrow will then populate throughout the shafts, the apophyses, as well as the epiphyses. And then in the adolescence, it becomes much more yellow marrow, which is areas of red marrow preserved within the proximal femur, areas within the distal metaphysis. And then with full-fledged adulthood, the distal femur around the knee is primarily fatty. Okay, so why does red marrow reconversion occur? So there's multiple diseases beyond sickle cell and thalassemia where you have increased oxygen demands. So any types of anemia can cause this. Areas where you need to perfuse more body with obesity, smoking, high altitudes, lots of different things can cause it. So it's not a really specific finding. But what you want to see primarily is the fact that there is T1 signal that's a little bit lower than fat, but it is typically higher than skeletal muscle. But it's not always the case, and sometimes it can be much more lower in signal. So here's a case of red marrow reconversion. You can see there's predominantly red marrow all throughout the distal metaphysis in the femur, the proximal tibial and fibular metaphyses as well. But on top of that, look at the articular surfaces. You have bone infarcts throughout both the medial and the lateral femoral condyles. So sometimes it can be confusing. So you can add chemical shift imaging within and out of phase imaging to really help resolve questionable cases. So if there's less than 20% signal loss going from your in phase to your out of phase, this is indeterminate. It's not absolute. So 25% of cases are going to be benign. So chemical shift imaging can help resolve questionable cases when there is a dilemma. So as you look at the in and the out of phase imaging, look at the signal drop off that's occurring that's much more marked in the out of phase imaging all throughout the visualized skeleton. So when this drops out, this can be caused by various things such as red marrow reconversion, but also edema, traumatic injury, and inflammation can have a similar effect, but it does help to differentiate this from a diffuse infiltrating malignant process. So if it's more than 20% signal loss, you can feel confident this is a benign diagnosis, such as red marrow hyperplasia. Next, we're moving on to thalassemia. So this is much more prevalent in patients around the Mediterranean Sea, such as Greece, Italy, Northern Africa, and its name actually comes from both Greek and Latin origin, which means blood of the sea. So with this, there's actually going to be defective genetic profiles on either the alpha or the beta hemoglobin subunits. So this is also an autosomal recessive disease. So with that, you want to have either the homozygous or the heterozygous variants uh, discussed. So when it's thalassemia major, this is the homozygous version, also known as Cooley anemia. So this is a very severe anemia. 
And with the destruction of the red blood cells, you're going to have iron overload. In addition to that, the treatment also is transfusions in these patients. And with that, you're going to have iron load in the viscera. You can have it in the skin with hyperpigmentation. And you can also have retarded growth patterns similar to sickle cell disease. So the heterozygous version is called thalassemia minor or thalassemia trait. So typically these patients are asymptomatic except when there are extremes of stress. So patients are cold, they're hot, they're dehydrated, and with that they can develop anemia, jaundice, and splenomegaly. We've already mentioned the heterozygous versions where you can have a combination of thalassemia with things such as hemoglobin C, S, H, or E. So the end result is very similar to the features of sickle cell disease that we've discussed. So marrow hyperplasia, bone infarcts, as well as increased risk for infection. So here's a classic case of thalassemia in the hands. So notice the red marrow hyperplasia is resulting in more squared appearance of the phalanges and the metacarpals as it is packing the bone marrow with more and more cells and red marrow. Skull. Hair on end appearance, just like the sickle cell disease, very similar fashion resulting because of the red marrow hyperplasia. So you're going to have that diffuse widening of the diploic space, thinning of the outer table, and that hair on end appearance as you see here. Here's a patient with more atypical presentation, uh, clinically presenting with a mass. And as you see here, there's preferential involvement of the frontal bones with the hair on end hyperplasia appearance. So here's a classic craniofacial appearance in a girl who has involvement of her paranasal sinuses with thalassemia. So they've been um, called chipmunk face because of that broad appearance, and that is once again because of the red marrow hyperexpansion all throughout the facial regions. If you look here on the lateral scout image from the CT, it has a more flattened appearance of the front of the facial region. Here's a patient with thalassemia who has the typical enlarged cardiac silhouette due to the anemia, but also look at the expansion of the ribs. So the frontal regions sometimes are more involved than the posterior ones. And also look at the paravertebral masses due to the extramedullary hematopoiesis. So it's actually more obvious on your lateral view of your chest X-ray. And if you look at a CT scan, you can appreciate why this is occurring. You have all these lobulated soft tissue masses, very classically around the thoracic spine, but they can also occur anywhere in the body. They can occur in the presacral space. You can also have enlargement of your liver and your spleen. So another patient with thalassemia. Look at this. You can see there's a lot of red marrow extramedullary hematopoiesis coming through the iliac bones. So this is a classic hair on an appearance, but it's not happening in the skull, it's happening in the iliac regions. And finally, here's a patient showing you the growth disturbances that are very classic in these patients with thalassemia. So if you look at these leg length views, you can see much regularity of the distal femoral metaphyses, and also look at the slanting of the ankles. And if you look at the overall orientation of the legs, there's a genu valgum, and you can look at the ankle valgum as well. So in conclusion, sickle cell disease and thalassemia are two of the most common hemoglobinopathies. They result in vasoocclusion and ischemia in the sickle cell patients because of the altered morphology of the cells resulting in the clogging of the vessels, bone infarcts, and with that, an increased risk for infection. Both sickle cell and thalassemia can have chronic anemia as prominent features of disease, and they're going to lead to compensatory marrow hyperplasia and sometimes extramedullary hematopoiesis, which is more common in the thalassemia patients. And then finally, premature physial fusion and vertebral deformities can lead to growth deformities. Thank you very much.